Now, in the Middle East, uh, Russia is uh, a power in decline. And it will remain so for any foreseeable future. In old uh, Soviet time, uh, military, ideological, economic uh, role is simply gone irreversibly. So even r raising the issue of some geopolitical rivalry in the region as one of possible explanations for Russia's uh, policy on Syria doesn't make much sense, frankly. There's simply no capacity for any uh, major geostrategic rivalry. Um, uh, but in parallel, of course, Russia, new Russia, developed some new uh, interests, uh, new uh, ties and partners in the region, uh, notably uh, with Turkey and Israel, uh, and also some new concerns. But the, they do not uh, reverse the general pattern, which is a plot. Decline. Uh, ironically, I would argue that this uh, strange mix of traditional power decline with some new interests and opportunities uh, might have even had some, uh, at least until the Syria crisis erupted, <laughs> might have even had some positive uh, effect on Russia's image in the region. Uh, uh, in particular, I refer to, uh, well, Russia's relatively low-key profile, uh, non-interventionist uh, profile, uh, its lack of ideological pressure, uh, its unique position as one of the very few major powers uh, uh, who, well, do not depend on the Middle East for energy supplies, so allows a degree of maneuver. Its historical record of support to many states of the region, uh, including in the anti-colonial struggles, its remaining influence in the UN. Uh, I mean, I would even uh, argue that uh, it might be precisely lack of any major strategic leverage or interest uh, that has allowed Russia to develop until recently at least, uh, a degree of uh, relative neutrality, uh, even a luxury of relative neutrality, a relatively balanced standing uh, between the Shia and the Sunni, uh, you know, secular nationalists, you know, Fatah and reformist Islamists, Hamas, and even to an extent between uh, the Arab uh, countries and Israel. Now, um, this relatively low-key but balanced standing was not immediately reversed as one Arab revolution started to erupt after another. Uh, not even by disagreements over Libya um, between uh, Russia joined by some states and a conglomeration of uh, NATO and uh, Arab Gulf states. Uh, somehow Russia stopped short of uh, one-sided, unconditional support to Gaddafi, even as economic interests, Russia's economic interests, especially potential contracts in Libya, were incomparably larger than those in Syria. Uh, so it was not uh, until internal conflict uh, became violent, turned violent in Syria, that uh, Russia's policy became an issue. Uh, so the questions are, we'll try to briefly address them today, what brought Russia to central stage? Uh, what made it pose as one of the very few external supporters of the Assad regime? And how and why has its policy evolved since then? Uh, there are three main conventional uh, explanations of why Russia supported uh, Assad in the first place. Uh, one is, uh, well, that's basically uh, surprisingly outdated perceptions about some indispensable, vital strategic interests that Russia uh, allegedly has in Syria, uh, referring mainly to arms uh, sales, uh, a base of this geostrategic rivalry. Other two explanations are more adequate. Uh, one is bad timing, specific uh, political pressures of the election season. Uh, in Russia itself, uh, and its projection into foreign policy, and uh, also um, the next uh, explanation, um, uh, traditional uh, sovereignty non-intervention uh, concerns, particularly at the UN level, reactivated by the Libya intervention, uh, and especially its fallout.
Now, uh, I wouldn't say that these three factors are negligible, but even a combination of the three doesn't give you the full picture. Strategic interests in particular are grossly exaggerated. I mean, all ties between Russia and Syria notwithstanding, uh, in a military, economic, cultural, educational, whatever, uh, the significance of Syria as buyer of Russian arms uh, should not be overestimated, especially in view of very poor paying record of Damascus. Um, this small naval facility in Tartus, I mean, really has more of symbolic than any real significance. Uh, politically, uh, the Assad regime uh, did not, until recently, particularly bother to pose as a Moscow's sort of hardcore ally. It was very eager, much more eager to reach out to the West, you know, to open up, to diversify its range of foreign policy partners. Uh, in terms of other economic interests in energy communication sector, well, they are present in Syria, but they are nothing compared to the huge volume of Russia's uh, cooperation uh, with its main economic partner in Eastern Mediterranean, which is Turkey. Uh, even the impact of um, Russia's turbulent parliamentary and presidential elections, uh, basically when the government, uh, the government's typical sort of aversion to any form of social political protest, Russian government, uh, the tendency to blame it all on external influences and the West in particular, uh, even that does not explain, frankly, this, this special attachment to the Syrian regime. No, I would say, no does uh, a mere reference, general reference to authoritarianism. You know, one state supports the other because they're both authoritarian. Uh, to me, it doesn't look like a sufficient explanation, again, because somehow this factor did not play a decisive role in Russia's policy towards Mubarak's Egypt or, or uh, disintegration of Gaddafi's Libya. Uh, one final reservation here, um, uh, uh, another simplification or another delusion would be to think that uh, a potential collapse of Assad regime in Syria uh, may have any direct impact on uh, positions of Russia's uh, regime. Uh, that's unlikely. Uh, but the main link may be less direct, but more fundamental in a way. Uh, reflect more substantive, even identity-based issues, almost instincts, I would say. Because a collapse of the uh, asset regime, if it comes by, would be not just a failure of an abstract authoritarian regime, it would be a failure of a national governance project uh, with a set of very specific characteristics uh, that distinguish uh, Syria uh, uh, even from other authoritarian republican regimes in the Middle East. And what are these characteristics? I mean, political and economic dominance of uh, neither a single charismatic uh, populist uh, leader slash clan, as in Gaddafi's uh, Libya, nor of uh, any broader party-based uh, class. So Ba'athism was not particularly a factor in this conflict. Political and economic dominance of a narrow, relatively closed, cased, a group of a distinct uh, shared origin, in Syria's case, sectarian origin, coupled with uh, the lead role for special security services uh, over all other parts of security sector and uh, other branches of government, coupled with no autonomous role for the military, in contrast to Mubarak's Egypt, uh, and all this crowned by general preference or pretense at smart authoritarianism uh, uh, under normal conditions for much of the past decade. Uh, but very easy, almost natural slide into harsh security solutions and uh, siege mentality uh, at the time of crisis, when the ruling group feels uh, threatened or its positions are threatened. Uh, now, a collapse of a regime like that, 
and also uh, the one which is a historical uh, client, if not exactly an ally, is a scenario that uh, Russia's own top ruling caste, being what it is, uh, uh, has been almost instinctively <laughs> reluctant to accept. In a way, it is a matter of reflex. It's not, not, it's not entirely rational, even. So, so explaining this final sort of critical thing that makes the difference in Russia's, at least uh, initially, un almost unconditional support to Assad, uh, that may be easy in terms of uh, instincts and reflexes, uh, rather than in terms of any uh, pragmatic foreign policy concerns. Now, do I have time? If, if, I, if I don't, I can shut up uh, at, any, at any point. <laughs> I will do it much, nice, much more nicely uh, than that. But I think we're going to move on to, to questions. And I'm sure yes. that That's people fine. in the audience will have many questions about uh, Thank Russia. Thank you very much for... Thank you very much for enlightening us, really, about what drives uh, Russia's policy yes. towards yes. Syria at the moment. Um, it is certainly uh, very interesting to hear all of your uh, interventions. Um, we are going to open the floor to questions in just a minute. We'll ask people to line up on both sides. The microphones are there, but I'm going to use my prerogative as a moderator to ask a very simple and quick question, and I will ask each of the panelists to answer as briefly as possible, just a couple of words, a couple of seconds. What if if anything, should the United States do now? Just a few words. We'll start with Amir. Uh, I think right now, having created this new Frankenstein coalition, they now need to show it some love. All right. <laughs> that's, that's very simple. I, I, <laughs> we'll make sure President Obama is listening. Um, Chaban, what about you? I, mean, I will go back to one point. Uh, met during his presentation about the stalemate and how to break it, what is the decisive move. I guess this is where the United States should have to be more forthcoming. This is, I guess, mm -hmm. also the Turkish stance that yeah. somehow there should be more resolute backing of the opposition. It might end up coming uh, to the case of supplying more weapons, especially to change the military uh, balance on the ground. I agree. Geneve? Uh, try to negotiate with Iran over the nuclear issue with the hope that this might give some sort of leverage on its involvement in Syria, even though that's highly unlikely. Well, President Obama today in his uh, first press conference in many months said that he was looking towards uh, you know, uh, reinvigorating that process of negotiation. So we'll see what happens there. Randa, what about you? Uh, invest time and human uh, resources in trying to see who's who inside Syria right now. I mean, to get to know the lay of the land before we move into any kind of action. And Ekaterina, for the perspective from Moscow, um, what do you think the Russians are expecting? I'm, uh, this is an anti-Russian micro. 